All right, folks, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about bringing a project to the ASF, give you a little background on myself. Uh, I'm a member of the ASF, although a relatively nascent member, uh, and I work on the project management committees for Apache Cloud Stack, uh, Apache J Clouds, and the incubator at the ASF. Uh, I've in, been involved to varying degrees with moving projects to different foundations, uh, and also a few uh, have considered it, but maybe not acted out on, on actually making the move. They've debated, weighed it several times. I also want to set the expectations. So this is not a talk about the incubator. Uh, there are on the schedule at least three different incubator talks. Uh, the folks who are talking uh, about the incubator are far better qualified than I am to speak about it. This really isn't a talk about the ASF, uh, though we'll kind of get ASF specific in a bit. This is somewhat a foundations talk and a process talk for, uh, for how you make that move and why you want to make the move, but it's not a process talk about how you make your project a wonderful uh, foundation ready place to develop software. So uh, please do seek out folks if you are really interested in joining the incubator uh, and coming into the Apache Software Foundation. There are great resources. Um, I'm happy to talk to you about that and there's, uh, there's a number of folks who are far better qualified than I am. So what I am going to talk about are misconceptions and confusion that people tend to have typically not when they join the incubator, not even when they graduate, but you start seeing this six months down post-graduation, uh, maybe a little earlier, uh, depending upon how long that incubation period is. And I also want to talk about why you might actually want to make a move. Um, and really the why is I see people who uh, come into foundations, some of them at the ASF, who are suddenly confused that it's no longer their project or they can't make decisions unilaterally. And I want to, uh, to kind of hopefully mitigate those, uh, th that kind of confusion and misconception uh, and make that decision-making process of whether to make the jump into a foundation a little better. So if you didn't attend the keynotes uh, this morning, uh, there is certainly a fascination going on with foundations. Uh, we seem to see two to three different uh, open source software foundations pop up every year now. And I personally think that that's a bad idea. Uh, I think that in most cases, people are spending enormous amounts of time reinventing the wheel. Um, when your software project has a goal, the goal is to release software, right? Uh, it is not to go get a 501c3 determination letter from the IRS and to set up governance for your corporation that's going to act as the foundation and then to set up project governance and uh, determine how you're going to raise money and then go out and actually raise it. Uh, so most software foundations that get started, they spend a year to 18 months doing nothing but uh, ramping themselves up so that they can actually act as a foundation. I think that's a tremendous waste of time. I also think that there's really not anything unique about most of these software foundations that doesn't already exist. Uh, so I think it's a horrendous idea for people to go out and found their own software foundation. Uh, there are different models. Uh, the Eclipse model is far more corporate controlled. Uh, the ASF model is the antithesis of that. Uh, and uh, there are places in between like uh, the Linux Foundation uh, that you know, are a happy medium between those two places. And there are a number of other places out there. There's the Software Freedom Conservancy and uh, Software in the Public Interest. Uh, there are, essentially is a home for any variation of open source software foundation you want and you have no need to reinvent that. So when we start talking about why you would want to move 
to a foundation, lots of people have different motivations. But I want to start with why you shouldn't. You want control. Um, the entire idea of moving to a foundation is that you want people to trust that you are going to act um, in the self-interest of your community. And that may be the community of developers, it may be the community of users, but if you want to still retain control, that's a very poor reason to jump into a foundation uh, or found one. I think you're deluding yourself if you think that you're going to um, form any type of foundation that has any real respect uh, and actually achieves its mission and still retain control. Simply isn't, is not realistic. You don't want outsiders interfering. Um, my favorite uh, open source project that I was very, I actually ran away from this project. Um, they said, we're, all of our code's open source, and we want the minimum viable product for an open source project now. And um, uh, minimum viable project and an open source community sh should not be, uh, uh, should not share the same sentence, but uh, they essentially said, we want enough that people recognize us as an open source project, but we really don't want outsiders interfering. We just want to go continue doing the same thing we've been doing as a proprietary project, um, and we want the, the holiness that attaches to you when you slap the open source label on, and uh, don't, don't let outsiders interfere. Uh, this wasn't even decision making because you, know, you would still have that benevolent dictator uh, making the decisions, but they didn't even want people you know, trying to make suggestions uh, or interfere with uh, their roadmap. So the corollary to that is if you have your own plan and you intend to execute on it and uh, aren't willing to allow other people to participate, uh, you should keep your software inside your firewall and uh, execute your plan. Uh, one, of the, one of the worst things that I've seen with the CloudStack project is people come and ask us what our roadmap is. And they're not talking what's coming in the next release, they're talking tell me what's happening in the next 18 months. And I don't know. And neither does anyone else, uh, if they're truthful, at least they don't know past what they're going to work on. Uh, and even that I don't think is completely sure. If the real reason that you're going to jump into an open source foundation or push a project there is to promote your company or to promote the product that your company has, it's a, it's a bad idea. If you're scared, um, because quite honestly, uh, a lot of companies are scared to death of people looking at what they've done and judging it. And uh, people are going to do that. They're going to do it on a mailing list. They're going to come across as scary people who think that you're stupid. Um, you should not be scared of that. Those people are actually complimenting you because they are spending the time to look at what you've done and then spend more time to tell you what they think. That's very valuable and you should, uh, you should take advantage of it. It's not something to be terrified of. And finally, if you think that your project or your company, or maybe even you yourself is unique, uh, you should avoid trying to get into a foundation because the entire goal should be collaborative development and that means that you're going to have to work with others. That means that you're going to have to um, realize that you are not unique, that you are merely a part of the community uh, and not irreplaceable. So, told you why not. Uh, anyone here actually have a project contemplating move to the incubator? I actually had an email from uh, someone this morning saying, I saw that you're talking about bringing projects to, uh, to the ASF, I'd really like to talk to you. And I said, are you here at ApacheCon? Because we could just talk in person, but uh, apparently not. Um, so, why move to a foundation? Um, Foundations do a lot of good things uh, that you just tend to not think about that quite honestly are unsexy and boring work. 
Uh, first is stewardship of IP. Uh, when you bring a project into the ASF or into any other reasonable foundation, one of the things that they're going to do is they're going to go through an IP uh, processing, an IP clearance stage, and they're going to uh, try and establish that there actually is provenance and that you have the right to distribute uh, this code. But it extends beyond copyright. Uh, you then have processes for how you accept uh, future contributions that simply don't exist uh, in most places outside of a foundation. Then there's also some of the other things. You've got brand, and, and Shane was talking about uh, brand issues a little earlier. Uh, preserving that brand uh, is something that, uh, that a foundation is typically, typically going to help you do. Uh, and quite honestly, that brand is really uh, as important or more important than the code that you release because you use that brand to engender goodwill, to, uh, to build a reputation for your project, and being able to preserve that is, um, is important, and uh, it also allows you to help build trust that it's not a big company's brand, that it's actually... Uh, that it's actually going to be a community brand. But even once we get past the actual assets, uh, things like backups and version control. So I actually uh, was involved with a project who made a jump to a foundation. They lived on GitHub, and there were zero backups that they know of. Hopefully GitHub was backing up the repository. But GitHub provided that service for free. So they've got no real obligation to you to, to provide backups or to restore things. Uh, you know, how are your assets, uh, while we give them away for free, they are not, um, that does not mean that they have zero value. Those, those types of assets actually need to be looked after. So things like backups, uh, ensuring that version control uh, is not tampered with. Those types of things are, are the boring, awful drudgery that foundations do a good job of actually executing on. The next is if you want to distribute control. And for most people, this is uh, not intuitive. Why do you want to uh, give up control? And you want to give up control because you want other people to, to buy in to uh, your vision of what the project should be. You want them to evolve that, iterate over that, and make it something greater than what you could do alone. You want to maybe remove your company as a community inhibitor. Uh, Jim Zimlin talked about there being glass ceilings for uh, proprietary controlled projects, and I think that is true, but I also think that your company's brand can interfere with that. Um, I used to work for a startup in 2011, and we were acquired by Citrix. And then I would go to an open source event and tell people I work for Citrix, and they go, so what does Citrix do with open source? Uh, Citrix doesn't do open source. Citrix has been involved in open source and had, um, had done poorly in my estimation with some of their early open source efforts. Um, and when we talked to people uh, about the move for CloudStack to the ASF, it was almost universally relief. You know, I, I really liked your product, but I, I don't think Citrix has a clue about open source. And I don't know what they're going to do with it. I can trust the ASF. I can't trust Citrix. Look at what they did with some other project that they screwed up seven years ago. It does give you the actual ability to grow a community, to give people a stake in something. And I think that when you, when you move from a product management, making decisions about what's going to be in the next feature, and allow a community member to say, you know, I really want to work on this particular feature. I will do the work to get it in. And if I do it in time, it gets into a release. Uh, I think that's very valuable. So I listed this last because I don't think that this is universally 
a benefit. Uh, we talk about legal protection uh, for the ASF and we have release processes to ensure that uh, releases are actions of the foundation. I don't think that, uh, I don't think this is universally true, but if you're just doing as an individual uh, releases from GitHub, you certainly have some exposure. Uh, if you're doing that as part of a company, you may ha actually have better legal protection within your company, but I bet your company is also a much more lucrative target than the ASF is, um, which might make uh, legal action against you even more readily apparent. Anybody disagree with my points so far? Everyone is just happy to agree with whatever I say. I need to go change some slides real quick, so uh, we'll, we'll uh, put up some controversial statements. And please, feel free to participate. Uh, if anyone just wants to listen to me, I'm sure I can provide you audio that will put you to sleep. So, is any foundation okay? I would say that a foundation is typically going to be better than a than a private uh, company running an open source project. I don't know that, uh, that there are any really awful choices, right? Most of the foundations that are still around today that are accepting projects uh, are doing a decent job. They admittedly have very different aims. And so you, know, you may have a very corporate, uh, commercial-centric model uh, at some foundations. You may have a very individual-centric uh, or uh, vendor neutral uh, aspect at others. It's a matter of what you end up looking for. So I said this wasn't about the ASF, but I do want to talk about why you might come to the ASF. And that really starts with there is a proven process. We talk about uh, you know, how you come into the incubator, and there's been two or three talks at uh, ApacheCon about that topic alone. There's copious amounts of documentation uh, that you can read about the process of actually becoming an Apache project. And there's 140 some odd success stories uh, that took the learnings of the early HTTPD project and said, you know, here's how you go and create a community around project. Here's how you uh, do open decision making. And then that's been replicated uh, to varying degrees, right? So some projects are absolutely successful in, in adoption. Some are absolutely successful in becoming the de facto standard. Um, but the bottom line is, is that today there's 142, I think, uh, top level projects at the ASF. And uh, there are a lot of, I think, uh, 30 some odd going through the incubator right now. There's a process to get, uh, to get you to a good known community state. I've said this a, a number of times uh, when folks ask, you know, tell me the reasons you came to the ASF. And you know, the, you know, we've got a proven process for getting things done. Uh, we didn't have to reinvent governance. We didn't have to reinvent uh, contribution policies. Uh, we didn't have to stand up all of our own infrastructure. Uh, and then one of them ends up becoming you know, we were Citrix, and Citrix does not have a strong open source reputation. We are not Red Hat. Uh, we are not uh, a number of other companies that have good open source reputations. Uh, the coming to the ASF and uh, eventually becoming a top level project was a tremendous stamp of approval and essentially gave us unassailable open source credibility. Uh, and I think from when you go and look at uh, most Apache projects, uh, the assumption is that they are, if they graduated to a top level project, that they have, uh, they've been judged by probably some of the most critical folks uh, who sit and get to sit in judgment of open source communities as being open, being, uh, being an independent uh, uh, open source project. Um, and that, uh, that graduation process uh, and that stamp of approval uh, is a huge, um, a huge indicator, not just to 
uh, the folks who are looking from the outside at your project, but also inside your project, they get to look and say, wow, you know, we are doing things right. Uh, maybe not perfect, but, you know, we passed this bar and, uh, and people are proud to be a part of a top level project at the ASF, especially if they go through that uh, incubation all the way to uh, graduation stage. And building on that uh, unassailable open source reputation, people know that you're going to be vendor neutral, uh, almost to a fault, right? Uh, it's not, you can't buy influence. You can't, uh, you can't uh, come in and, and wield tons of influence, except by bringing uh, contributions to the project, right? Uh, you pony up uh, developers, you pony up documentation writers, and they improve the project and they gain influence by actually doing things. Uh, so you can't come plop down half a million dollars and say, I would like a seat on your project management committee. Uh, the committer bit, the uh, being on the project management committee is something that you earn. And you have to actually demonstrate to the underlying community that you are worthy of their trust. Uh, and so that brings us to meritocracy, right? Uh, anyone can come into an Apache project and be judged based upon their ideas and the quality of their work. And uh, that is especially compelling for smaller places. There are a number of projects that uh, very large corporations like Microsoft or IBM or Oracle are involved in. And at the same time, you will have small startups uh, or independent consultants who work on the same projects. And you know that the people from uh, one very large corporation and one very small company have essentially exactly the same weight. Uh, they, that may vary based upon their actual contributions, but the base level is still going to be the same. Yes? This, that's also why we strive for a diverse, um, diverse PMCs, right? So we don't want Citrix to be the only uh, employer of people on a given PMC. And while we might, you know, there might be cases where the majority of folks are from a single employer, uh, the idea is that you have enough balance, enough voices to balance that out to one degree or another. Yes. So, so uh, having not participated at all in CouchDB, I don't want to sit in judgment of what's going on in CouchDB, so we'll make up a, an imaginary uh, project. Since Steve got his own Apache project, I'm going to have Apache David. And in the Apache David project, um, it's great to have new features come in, um, but one of the mantras at the ASF is community over code. And, um, I'm not saying that I would issue a veto on code coming in that caused me concerns from a community perspective, uh, but that would certainly be one of the things that I would consider and, and would be talking about. And this is, this is actually one of the strengths. Um, I've occasionally described it as a bully pulpit, but within the, ASF, uh, within the ASF's governance model, uh, once a person has earned merit and becomes a committer, they essentially can issue a veto for a technical reason uh, and stop any single commit uh, up until a release. Once a release has been kicked out, then uh, 
then that's there. You know, it's kind of irrevocable at that point because you've published it. Uh, but you can go and look at uh, you know, any single commit or set of commits, and as a committer on any Apache project, as a committer on that specific Apache project, you can say, you know, there's a problem with this, here's the problem, consider this my veto, and please revert it. And uh, those are considered binding, uh, which means that uh, even though a company may have 15 or 20 developers that they're paying to work on something, a single developer who has a concern can you know, put the brakes on and say, hang on, we need to think about this before we move forward. Um, I think that's incredibly powerful. I don't know that in Apache David that would be the, the right course of action, but I would also, um, you know, if that kind of concern is, uh, is really present, my question is, what does the rest of the PMC think? If, uh, if there are uh, projects who have different aims, uh, you know, the ASF uh, tends to frown upon umbrella projects where the, uh, the community and the committers have disparate interests. You know, if I don't care at all about uh, Apache David's um, web server, but I do care about Apache uh, David's database, then maybe those should be uh, separate projects with separate project management committees. Um, but you know, it, when I look at uh, when I look at the um, the responsibilities, particularly of PMC members. Uh, they are responsible to the board to ensure that, uh, that the community is healthy, that they are actually behaving uh, according to the principles that the ASF uh, has set forth. And um, I, I think it's, uh, I don't think it ought to be a run to the, run to the board to solve my problems, but I certainly think that you know, if there are, there are truly problems that threaten the, the project, uh, our project independence, uh, or the meritocracy of a project, uh, I certainly would, would expect that uh, PMC members of Apache David to be concerned and either actively talking about or calling attention to. Um, I actually wanna hear Shane's input because he's actually a director and I am merely, I'm merely one of the people who sit on the sidelines and say, why haven't you kicked those people out yet? I don't think it's quite that dire, but. Uh, <laughs> it, it's interesting, you would expect, uh, looking at anything else, you would expect chaos uh, out of that particular model where anyone can throw a monkey, or anyone who has demonstrated merit can throw a monkey wrench into the entire process. And uh, that actually doesn't tend to be the case. Um, there's actually a great book, uh, if you want to uh, understand the, um, uh, the actual sociological aspects of it. Um, it's called The Starfish and the Spider, and they actually feature the ASF as a case study, although it's a much earlier ASF than, uh, than you see today. Um, and they actually also talk about uh, the Apache Indian tribe uh, and their leaderless model of, of governance. Uh, as another one of those case studies. It's a fascinating read. So uh, hopefully this gives you some, some incentive, right? Uh, so I want to talk about challenges, and these are not necessarily unique to the ASF. Um, but there are some significant challenges when you move to a foundation. Uh, the first almost universally the first problem is decision making and where it happens. Um, and this continues to be a perpetual problem even with projects who have long since graduated. Uh, it is very easy to, oh, you know, I, I work next to this guy, I will go and have a conversation with him 
and forget to report the conversation on a mailing list or to instead have that conversation on the mailing list because you talked to him at the water cooler or you went and had lunch with him. And uh, those things, um, if you read Carl Fogel's book on producing open source software, he said that every single one of those communications is a threat to uh, the project. And I think that's certainly true when a project is nascent. I think it becomes less of an issue uh, as a project matures and grows and the community becomes more and more diverse. Uh, but I do think that decision making and having to bring that decision making out in public, even if there's no one else participating with you, uh, is a very difficult thing for most people to get used to. Particularly if you have never done open source software, this idea that you would toss out multiple options, uh, weigh them in public is, is very foreign. Uh, most people, particularly people who have developed software um, and not been doing it for a really long time when sharing was the norm. Uh, so, you know, basically anyone from uh, 20 to 45, uh, they've been taught repeatedly, do not talk outside the corporate walls, do not share information. If you're going to share information, you need to get permission from the following executives who will review the information that you want to share and tell you whether or not it's appropriate and may shift your message. And so people are, uh, quite frankly, scared to talk publicly. Um, and then there are cultural issues of, well, someone disagreed with me. And I'm used to my manager handing me down instructions. And then I go do that. I'm not used to publicly debating. And uh, for a lot of people, this actually causes them um, quite a bit of anxiety. And they don't know uh, how to deal with all this strife that is open source. And yet, most open source people see that as very healthy. Um, and I've actually had some uh, coworkers who have essentially said, all of these people hate me. They never agree with me. And I said, they're spending time talking to you. They occasionally agree with you after four or five emails. Why would they waste their time if they hated you? They would just uh, ignore all of your emails, not allow you to get anything done. Uh, this, is, this is universally, I think, the hardest thing. Uh, when I look at podlings coming in, uh, this is the thing that I think they struggle with the most. The next is brand. Um, there are a number of folks who imagine that coming to the ASF is going to be a great marketing vehicle for them and that it will now become big company foo Apache bar. And I've seen questions about, we're going to register a trademark and then we'll keep it, right? We'll get to retain the rights to use that brand. And almost invariably, regardless of whether you're coming to the ASF or not, if you're moving to the software, you're going to have to make brand decisions. And it is perfectly reasonable for you to keep and retain your brand for your company, but that will not be the project brand. The project needs to be independent, and it needs its own brand. That can be the one that you've spent time creating, or it can be a new one. Uh, there are a number of projects who, uh, who've done a good job around building a brand. I think Cordova, they had a false start with the uh, callback brand initially, but Cordova has actually grown to be a relatively well done brand in a short period of time. Uh, and that was new after they entered incubation. Uh, I think there are also, you need to think about the brand effects. If you've got something that is very tightly coupled with your company brand, then using a brand uh, that has that tight association may be problematic as you try and grow, the, uh, grow your community because the outside world, regardless of how well you're doing with uh, actually making the project independent and acquiring a diverse community, the outside world will always think of, oh, that was uh, the project from Citrix. And there is some danger there, uh, though I don't think it's necessarily um, something you can't overcome. Process. I said process was actually a reason that you would want to move 
to a foundation, having a known process for getting code in, having a known process for feature acceptance, having a process for getting the commit bit, uh, those are all wonderful things. People are not used to uh, having to assume process all the time. They are used to having uh, someone in a place of authority who can actually go and make decisions rather than, okay, we have this process for how we evaluate people and give them the rights to commit to a repository. We have this process by which we release software and this portion of that process is uh, a mandate and we have some other parts that may be optional. Okay, now we've gotta go through this process and, and actually get things done. And so this adds overhead and it adds uh, time, especially in the beginning when there's a lot of confusion. Um, the biggest hurdle that most people actually cross in an incubating project at the ASF is making the first release. Because people are so confused about the process, what's actually involved, what you actually release, how you release it, going through the entire IP audit process is very confusing. And the sad thing is that most of that is one time very painful uh, experience and then it becomes something that you can maintain as you go along. Uh, but that process, you know, you go from releasing software once a month when you were able to make the decision on your own and didn't have such processes in place to taking nine months to get your first release out the door. And that's an extreme example with a huge code base, but uh, took I think 11 months for OpenOffice to get their first release out. Go ahead, Shane. Am I? Okay. I'm almost out of time. Uh, so the final challenge is you can't get uh, a guarantee of success. There are lots of examples of projects failing or projects deciding that it's not worth it. And not a huge number at the ASF, uh, although it's certainly, uh, certainly possible to fail at the ASF. Uh, but success isn't guaranteed. You could invest all of this work and at the end of the day, maybe you, uh, maybe you just come to terms that you're not gonna do that and your project will live on GitHub forever. Uh, so there's plenty of reasons not to, uh, uh, not to jump to a foundation. There's plenty of reasons that going to a foundation is absolutely worthwhile. And hopefully I'm, I've given you something to think about. I'm happy to, to answer questions and, or talk to people individually if you have questions. If not, I'm happy to cut you loose because I know that there are food trucks outside uh, that you will have to stand in a long line. I have no idea what the temperature out is this morning. So, Yesterday it was cold and the lines were very long. Good, good. I haven't actually exited the hotel so far today. So, Thanks very much. I appreciate you coming and, uh, and listening.